Welcome to the Shipping Pod. I'm Tim Dooner, here with... Ryan Dooley. Hey, Ryan, how are you? Born ready, ready to go, man. I'm with you, Ryan, because it's uh, it's time to get busy like ants on top of a hot pot. hey <laughs> Ants on top of a hot pot. I like, it. I like it. I like it. I like it. It's an old Chinese saying. I like it. Is it? Really? Yeah. That's it's- awesome. Hey, happy year of the rooster, my friend. Yeah, here comes the rooster. Oh, yeah. That's right. Allison Chains. Oh, bringing it back, baby. Bringing it back. I love it. I love it. Well, we got a lot to talk about today, Tim. Take us out, man. Grab the helm. Take us out, bro. Ryan. Yes. What did we do this week? Since the last podcast, you mean? Since the last po- Since last Tuesday. Yeah, since the last po- Since last Tuesday, we attended the MIT scale function together in tandem. We sure did. With some members of our Connect Young Professionals group, we went, we saw young kids, inspired minds of MIT. We took some pictures, we talked to some people, we learned some things about inventory management, optimization, a lot of different stuff. Hey, did you know that the Latin American countries may or may not be prepared for economic collapse? Quick hint, looks like they're not. Yeah, well, the scale event, and first of all, getting there was was a bit interesting because GPS in Boston is... With all the detours and everything, you never can uh, absolutely exact science. Say it. You can absolutely say it. It was uh, it was poor driving by me. I'm I'm better in the suburbs. I could have been a better navigator at times. If you if you ever ask my <laughs> wife, she'll she'll tell you that I'm probably one of the worst navigators there is. <laughs> we did uh, we did struggle, and the funniest part was that uh, when we went over the bridge to get to MIT, and we took spin around the block and did a couple of weird turns, and ended up parking in the garage. The place that we were going to was quite literally right over the bridge. It was a, it was a lot of movement not to travel that far. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We put some miles on the, uh, on the car. Yeah, going in circles, but we eventually did get there, right? Yes, we did. We All roads it. led to Rome, or in this case, MIT. Indeed. Well, what what did you take away from the scale event? Oh, all kidding aside, I thought it was a fantastic event. Um, one of the one of the key things that I took away from it was, for a bunch of young twenty somethings, they are operating with some live ammunition in the brain department, my friend. Thinking some very intricate thoughts about a number of supply chain and logistics projects. Like the whole the whole crux of it, if I can go this far to say, is that they're doing pro- projects that are sponsored by individual companies trying to take on essentially logistics and supply chain problems and come up with not necessarily a solution, but a method to find the solution. And uh, my takeaway was the leaders of the supply chain and logistics field, some of them were in that room with us. We were in the presence of our future bosses. It was interesting because when I first got there, I, I'd heard it from you. Mm-hmm. I'd heard about the events. I wasn't sure what to take away from it. There wasn't a ton of information on the website. Probably not the best immediate sales opportunity in the world, but it was kind of interesting to see, because I'd never seen MIT's scale program before. I'd never seen their supply chain or logistics program. So A, it was really great to sort of get an idea of what they're doing there. Sure. Once, after a couple of presentations, I really kind of saw what was going on. I wasn't sure if they were trying to, to you know, push applications on us or this or not, or that, but yes. it was, it was mostly they were taking, they were taking data and they were, they were compiling data and analyzing people's supply chains. Or in some cases, analyzing, you know, regional markets. Sure. Or the markets of, of Latin America was a big one that we saw. Those guys had a great presentation. Yeah. No, I think uh, I think you nailed it on the head there is that the initial, because there's not a ton of information up front, your initial impact is, are they trying to push something on us? Are they trying to, not not specifically sell, but are they trying to sell you something? Are they trying to give you an idea of something? But I don't think that's the case. It's more of a 
networking opportunity for the individuals making the presentation. And that's the reason why I'm, I'm assuming that's the reason why that they want members of the industry to come and provide feedback and talk to them. If for nothing else, you know, there were people that had resumes handy, had business cards handy. I mean, there's a lot. If you were, I'll say this, if you were an employer, especially if you were, say, a small 3PL or anyone that's trying to grow and needs some assistance in the project management side, this would be, that would be a dream of it. Go there, talk to some people, maybe you catch somebody's eye, or maybe somebody catches your eye that you might be able to work with in the future. I give it two thumbs up. All the credit in the world to the MIT program. Those kids were doing some good stuff. Yeah, one thing that I I liked quite a bit was there was a presentation forecasting, I guess, inventory. It was an inventory forecast for what's what's needed in the future, which it's a tough model to build. But what I really like that... Was this the enough is enough? The bottling one that you're talking about? Or are you talking about that independent... The uh, optimization predictability. Optimization predictability. And what I liked about their presentation was they were talking a ton about data data purity. And data mm-hmm. purity is something that, if you're not on the tech side, you know, it, it build this model, build our inventory in there. But the thing is, there, there's such a blizzard of, of information. Mm-hmm. There's so much white noise that gets included when you, when you just run your reports that in order to make these predictive models, you have to find out what data is good and what data is bad. Uh, firsthand, I was working for, for one company and we were trying to put in a landed cost model. And the reason it, it never worked and we were never to get it work is at the capture level. The data capture and events that we needed to create that model just were not occurring. And we didn't have the people in the right places to make that happen. And we didn't have possibly enough people that really understood what the actual problem was. Mm-hmm. And and I say that because the data capture level was was really happening on our end. So the only ones that could have improved it were us. But so it ended up just getting tabled. But it's great to see young minds like this working to solve problems using tech in so many different and exciting ways. I, I was blown away by some of these kids. And all they really wanted was our vote to win that that lovely uh, trophy. It looked like the Excite Bike trophy. It, it was. It was. If someone told you to draw a picture of a trophy, that's it. Had the handles on the side. <laughs> yep. You could drink out of the thing. Absolutely, it was very. It was Stanley Cup esque. I think. Uh, I really hope that over the years they add more levels to it, so eventually it's about like seven feet tall. That's what I want them to do with that trophy. That that would be. But then you, would, I guess, you'd have to give it back every year, right? You'd have to relinquish your your yeah. trophy. I'd be okay with that, though, like an annual... T- Maybe they give you a little plaque to keep so you can be like, hey, back in 2017, I won this. Yeah. But the actual trophy goes back. Hmm. Well, that was the MIT scale event. It was, a, it was a great time. Yeah. Ryan and I tried to get out to all of the things that we mentioned on our events calendar. Mm-hmm. That- oh, side note. Yeah. We have pictures of that event, too, up on the Instagram. We have pictures up... Uh, I believe some pictures are going to go up in the Connect newsletter for that event. So if anyone wants to see the trophy you're talking about... I believe we have uh, the trophy in the background of the photo of you and I on the stage. Yeah. And if you would like to follow us on Instagram, that's Instagram.com slash The Shipping Pod. The Shipping Pod. You can reach out to us on Twitter at The Shipping Pod. You can email us, The Shipping Pod at gmail.com. And you can listen to us, not just how you are now, but also on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and everywhere podcasts are listened to. Yes. I think we should do a live podcast too one day. From us, from the Wilbur. Oh, I plan on it. I plan on it. Maybe we'll be up to speed on that. Maybe by Northeast Cargo Symposium. Sounds like a plan. Maybe sir. earlier though. We might we might get bored of your basement and just have to strike out yeah. on the streets. I think we should. I think we should do a live. I think we should do a live broadcast at the Connect event. This studio is is easy enough to bring to. We got it packs into a, a duffel bag. There you go. You're a man on the run. I am a man on the run. <laughs> what else happened? Well, I guess it's not what happened, but what's happening. Patriots in the Super Bowl. Patriots in the Super Bowl coming up, man. Yeah. They are coming up. It's impending on us. I've been watching uh been watching Media Day. I think uh I think somewhere in the future we're also gonna have to bring the shipping pod to Media Day for a Super Bowl. Hopefully the Patriots will be in it, but I mean any Super Bowl really would work. Yeah. And and I think a good topic to maybe discuss with them is is where the Atlanta Falcons are going to be sending their Super Bowl champion jerseys. Which nation will will get them? Yes. Because you're not going to be able to sell them in retail stores No. after they lose on Sunday. Exactly. Some uh, some uh, third world, you know, maybe like a maybe like a Central African nation is going to end up with a whole bunch of like, you know, Falcons world champions 2017. It's going to happen. They're going to have hats. They're going to have jerseys. <laughs> they merchandise the wazoo out of these things yeah 
So there'll be some well-dressed. Uh, the Atlanta Falcons, they've always had one of my favorite color schemes and cool. logos. You can't go wrong. Red and with, black. Yeah. yeah. And the white. You're oh, going to yeah. look good out there in the Sahara or wherever you may be when you get your Atlanta Absolutely. Falcons Super Bowl champion jersey. You won't be Serengeti camouflage, but you're going to look good when that tiger's eating you. Yeah. I mean, and we're, we're Boston-based. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> we're Boston-based, so it's, it's no secret probably who this podcast is rooting for. No. I mean, we're we're pretty objective, but it's it's definitely going to be the Patriots. <laughs> Do you got a score? I think it's going to be a high flying one, man. I think it's going to be. I'm going to go with thirty four twenty six. Interest. You see, the Atlanta Falcons took me a bit by surprise. I didn't have Devonta Freeman or Julio Jones or or even Matt Ryan in fantasy, so I didn't follow them a ton. Mm-hmm. This season, and I didn't think they were going to get past Green Bay. So the fact that they not only beat Green Bay, but dominated them. <laughs> Put a spanking on them. With a, yeah, I mean, their, their defense looked good. Their offense looked good. Every Everything everything looked pretty sharp. It's in Houston, right? It's in a dome. Yeah. I think the Patriots pull it out. You're not seeing a high-flying offense, though? No, I, I'm, I'm seeing more like 27-24-ish. Okay. I... I hear what you're saying. I think it could go either way. I honestly think that, I honestly think that in the dome, this year, just with the motivation they got, and I'm not one to go on that, you know, oh that F Goodell type motivation type thing, but I honestly think there's going to be some big scoring. I think both quarterbacks are going to try and go for the gold on this. So, hmm. we'll see what happens, sir. Gentlemen's wager. Yeah. Well, sure. Um, <laughs> think that up real quick. Think it up in your head, and you can come back to me with that one. But before I lose my thought, so I was at. I was at Planet Fitness before I, I came here, and I was on the, the exercise bike. And lo and behold... What brand exercise bike is it? I don't know. It's a recumbent, though. Ooh. I like the recumbent because I can kind of lean back, and I can read and do some work. And nice. I was actually watching some YouTube videos on nice. our topic today, Chinese New Year. Very but good. But as I'm watching it, that pinhead, Max Keller, Kellerman. Mm-hmm. Remember, he used to have IMAX yeah. when Fox Sports Network used to be a big a big thing? Yeah. Well, I guess he's back. He's back on, on ESPN or First Take or, or one of those shows. Mm-hmm. And they were bringing up what you knew was going to eventually come up. That old photo of Tom Brady <laughs> with the MAGA hat in his locker. <laughs> right? The Make America yep. Great Again hat. That has officially become some of the dialogue of Media Day. Hey, how can you avoid it, man? I mean, from the moment that that, that, first, uh, that first little presser that they did in front of his locker with that hat there... You had to know, win or lose, he was going to be saddled with that. That was not going to go away. It'll be probably a couple of... Assuming Brady plays a few more seasons, it's going to be with him for a few seasons, man. It sure is. I don't think... Well, we're, it'll really come back to haunt him, I guess, is if he tries to run for politics in a blue state, they're going to maybe bring up this old Trump loyalty or, or Trump allegiance. Personally, in terms of football or context, I don't necessarily think it's appropriate for media day. I don't no. see what it has to do with the game or Tom Brady. Nothing. Yeah. Your your uh, star athlete doesn't have to be your best friend, and they don't have to vote the same way you do behind the curtain. No. Whatever happened to voting being like a very secret thing? Like, you don't ask people who they vote for, and people don't tell you who they vote. It used what to be, happened to that? It used to be rude to ask, and it used to be rude to say it. And yeah. But now it's it's in your face nonstop. If you go on, on Facebook, you're going to get inundated with with opinions on on both sides yes, some sir. people seem to do this all day long they just they repost every single article they see <laughs> regarding it but here at the shipping pod we really only care about what effect trump has on trade yes that, that's our concern some big news came out last week trump signed another executive order and it was something that i thought was just sort of rhetoric for his base hey, the wall the wall yeah I thought you were going to talk about the uh, the immigration ban. I thought that's I thought that's where you were going with it, but yeah, the wall. <laughs> that's a that's a thing. It doesn't really affect trade so much, but the no. wall, <laughs> the wall most certainly does because for as long as it's been talked about, Trump has also said that Mexico is going to pay for the wall. Mm-hmm. How exactly is Mexico going to pay for this? Well, Trump has and his administration have. This idea that they can pay for it via a twenty percent import tax. Mm-hmm. So my <laughs> my question, because the and there is some distinction between if this is going to be a tax or a tariff. 
just for the sake of simplicity at, at the moment, one way or the other, they're trying to pass to the 20%. They're, they're trying to do it to all imports. This is what Sean Spicer said. He's the, the secretary yep. of that. So he said that they're going to they're gonna institute this 20% tax. That's going to pay for the wall. So my question to you is, Ryan. Yes, sir. This isn't an export tax. This is an import tax. Indeed. So this means that U.S. companies are actually the ones paying the 20%. But companies don't do that. They're going to push that to the side of the margin. Yeah. And they're just going to increase that. Or they could obviously produce less goods in Mexico. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on that? I Well, this is kind of, you know, you hit right on the key element for me. And it's the part that I've been curious about. Similar to my feelings about the, the, uh, you know, the NAFTA and the TPP stuff that we talked about last week. My only real question is a deeper explanation from the administration as to what they think the actual application and outcome is going to be from the different companies. Because, I mean, let's face facts. Anytime that the cost of operating increases, it's pretty rare, I'd go so far as to say never happens, that the company says, oh, no problem, we'll take it on the chin and cut into our profit margin. They pass that along to the consumer. So a profit margin, with the exception of any kind of external factor, such as people stop buying a product, the profit margin is going to try and maintain a certain amount of integrity. So... If you add 20% onto goods coming into the country, you may deter some companies from purchasing the goods from the origin point of, say, for this case, Mexico. But if it does, per- if, they, if the company does purchase those products and has to sell them, they're just going to jack it up 20%, and then the American consumer is going to be faced with a choice of, do I buy American or do I buy imported? But not always are they going to have the option of buying an American version of that product. They're not exactly quite as, you know widespread as they used to be. So if I had to say overall, I have concern about it just because I'm concerned about what the impact to my personal pocket is going to be. That's my personal concern. Uh, from an overall standpoint, though, and this is where I mentioned it to you briefly before we got on the air here, is there was some explanation in the language about a border-adjusted tax, which goes into a little more detail about destination cost taxation versus value-added taxation. And I'm Still not up to speed with it. I've been reading it, you know, repeatedly trying to understand this. And my understanding is that it's a way of forcing the actual exporter of the goods to pay the tax up front as opposed, as opposed to essentially leaving it as like an FOB charge for the destination, for the consignee. So as long as the consignee, in this case the importer of the U.S. company, doesn't have to pay the tax, hey, I think... We might actually have stumbled onto a pretty good thing, but I'm not 100% sure exactly how that implementation works. Yeah, well, it's been mentioned by Trump, too, who initially, I don't know if he still is, because, again, we only know what's coming out of Sean Spicer, but initially Trump was against that type of, of tax. So it seems like he's leaning more towards a tariff for simplicity. He's, he, it seems like he wants to do 20% across the board as an import tariff based on valuation of goods, which would obviously completely change NAFTA. Mm-hmm. But let's talk some numbers real quick before we move to our main topic. So what does trade represent in Mexico? In 2015, it was $295 billion (laughs) imports from there, which is 13.2% of all U.S. imports. That's not chump change, my friend. It, it, yeah, that is significant, man. (laughs) (laughs) That is a a humongous portion when you're talking 13.2% and we're talking about radically changing a trade agreement that helped build that that trade economy and that trade market some other numbers to consider Mm -hmm. when talking about the wall we've seen a bunch of independent research on it what it's going to take how it's going to how it's going to be built what i've heard what most people seem to agree on is between 15 and 25 billion dollars yeah we're looking at about 15 to 16 years 2,000 miles of of steel and and rebar (laughs) There's going to be a lot of eminent domain declared, uh, wildlife disrupted, terrain that is going to be an engineering marvel or mm-hmm. a nightmare, depending on how you look at it to implement. But it seems to be that's what they're they're leaning towards now. I'm not sure how much of a barrier there is in front of that, how much resistance there is going to be. Because when we talk about this too, Ryan, this is a huge project. That's If it goes 16 years, that's going to be, even if Trump goes eight years, that's going to be multiple administrations. Yeah. And it's going to be at least three. And I mean, it's one of those ones where that means that 
you're either going to have two administrations that are going to follow one of the most drastic changes to international trade policy as well as just diplomatic relationships with one of our directly landlocked neighbors. You're going to have two separate administrations, possibly from two different parties, but, you know, worst case scenario, you're left with half a wall. I don't know which I don't know which end they're going to start from, but either California and half of Texas, or <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm guessing they start in Cali and they go they go that way. It's a it's a big gamble. I can understand why I can understand why the Republicans would want it mm-hmm. in the sense that if you get eight years of Trump and this wall is is you know five years into production at this point or six years into production, this is what the next guy after Trump and the Republican Party can run on. Sure. Because every Democrat that runs against him is is going to use the wall as a as a point of opposi- opposition, as a pivot point, something to to get away from, and something to engage and and energize the populace with. Unless it starts to, I mean, you know, I want to, and we, we get feedback from friends, colleagues, and such like that. And one of the pieces of feedback that we got was that um, we were somewhat anti-Trump, a little too on the Democratic side. So I want to be very clear and upfront with saying this is. Although I don't think the wall is the way to go, I could be 100% wrong. And maybe the wall assists in this effort of, you know, generating this, you know, trade element here for the taxation. And it might have separate impacts that are positive. It might have, see, my concern when we talk about these changes to the tax plan, as far as, you know, increasing our tariffs on imported goods from other com- other countries, is any kind of retaliatory tariffs that might be placed on American goods. If that's not the case and we don't enter into that, this is nothing but good. I mean, there'll be added revenue and all kinds of stuff. I mean, this could actually be a very solid, you know, financial and economical boom if it works. I personally don't think it's going to, but I'm willing to see. I'm like, hey, if if they've got the project rolling and we're going to start it, I'm like, well, like I said, it's a bad idea to do it halfway. So if you're going to do it, well, then do it. Let's see what happens. (laughs) It's a big gamble, Cotton. Let's see how it pays off. It's a bold gamble. (laughs) Did you see, going back to Donald Trump's good friend, to pull a Max Kellerman, Tom Brady, did you see him speaking Chinese? He put out a lovely Chinese New Year greeting. I did. I saw it on, uh, I think I saw it on Instagram. I saw a clip. I saw a clip of it. A quick, a brief clip. Hey, do you speak any Chinese, Tim? She mean quite a lot. Oh man, is that it? Was that good? Can I try another one? I would I like you to. I'd like you to try another one, man. She mean quite a lot. No, that wasn't good either. That that lingered a bit. You're doing horrible on that. Okay, so let me hear yours. Okay, I'm going to start off with, uh, this is New Year goodness, which I'm assuming is their equivalent of Happy New Year. Xin yin hao. Sen yin hao. That's in Mandarin and Cantonese right there for you. Xin yin kuai la. How was that? That was pretty That's good. good. That was good. That was a lot better. That's good. Xin yin kuai la. I like it. All right. I feel like, I, I see, that's the thing, though, is I know inflection and how it's supposed to work in the English language. I don't know what the exact inflection point is for the Cantonese and the Mandarin. So I don't know, should I stress the first one hmm. or the third one? I don't know which one. I I have listened to a few native speakers say it as well, mm-hmm. but I obviously don't speak much Chinese, so it's very difficult, as you mentioned, to get the inflections down and to really get yeah. the exact sounding. It just sounds like I have a bad accent. It sounds like someone trying to do a Boston accent in a Boston movie. The only one I can do is uh, Ni Hao. I've got that one pretty well down. Just saying hello. When it, from my time in China, that's the only one that he said. Yeah, that sounds right. Well, Xin Yin Kuai La, Ryan. Happy New Year. Happy Year of the Rooster. Happy Year of the Rooster to you too, sir. This is, without a doubt, the biggest holiday in our industry. It affects it affects more than than anything. People think that you know peak season may be caused by by Christmas or other holidays. Not even close. True. Very uh, true. It does hit the, uh, like you speak, the, the Christian-based, uh, you know, I guess it's really just Christmas. I was going to say Easter, but that really doesn't pop up. But the Christian-based holiday of Easter, uh, excuse me, of Christmas hits our local economy, but it's much briefer and much smaller than the Chinese New Year. <laughs> well, Chinese New Year goes on forever. <laughs> Ryan, do you know why it is so big and so influential? No. One-fifth, one-fifth of the world's population celebrates Chinese New Year. Really? They sure do, Ryan. 
I did not know it was quite that high of a percentage. What else you got, man? Well, well, tell me something about Chinese New yeah, Year. Yeah, before we get into how Chinese New Year affects trade, let's talk a little bit about what Chinese New Year is. Mm. Chinese New Year is also known as the Spring Festival. It's celebrated not just in mainland China, it's celebrated throughout Asia. Mm-hmm. It runs from the evening prior to the first day of the Lunar New Year. Yes. It's one and, of those floating holidays. Yeah, too. it's until the Lantern Festival on the 15th day. So mm-hmm. it runs for a couple weeks. This year, it began on January 28th. And because it's based on the lunar calendar, it's not like where Christmas is always going to be the 25th. It can be earlier and later in the month of January to February. Oh, absolutely. It's, again, anywhere between January 21st and February 20th would be the first day of it, completely dependent upon the moon which which goes off basically their their zodiac lunar calendar Indeed. Ryan, i don't know if you knew this about the zodiac calendar what's that well you do you, you know that it's 12 animals right and they represent each represent a a, a year-long cycle yes right and it's a repeating 12-year cycle of animals as opposed to our astrological signs which we give only we only wait as a month as in i'm a sagittarius oh sure because i'm born in this time period over the span of a month Absolutely, Ryan. That, that, that's, that's very true. But one thing you may not know is that there were originally 13 zodiacal. Really? Zodiacal? Zodiacal animals. I'm going to go zodiacals. Zodiacal. <laughs> okay. But do you, so do you know the origin story? No. Uh, so the ancient origin story of the zodiac calendar is, Spin me a is yarn. interesting. Well, Ryan, see, a long time ago in ancient China, there was a great race and it involved 13 animals. The 13 animals of the Zodiac. And the Zodiac calendar is in order of where those animals finished. Oh, crap. However, there's only 12, right? So what happened to the 13th animal? Still waiting to finish? It was a cat. Oh. So what happened here is the rat and the cat could not swim. So they hopped on the back of an ox to go across a river, which is right before the finish. (laughs) Uh, the Finnish being, I believe it was an emperor at the time, they were going to see him. So they jumped on here, and the rat, as they were crossing the river, pushed the cat in the water. Whoa, horrible. Pushed the cat in the water. The cat, as we mentioned, could not swim. The cat drowned. The cat is dead. Now there's only 12 animals. The Zodiac calendar is based on where these animals finished in the race. Do you know what the first year of the Zodiac calendar is? Year of the rat. It is the year of the rat. And yes! Yes! So what happened is, when they got to shore, the rat jumped off the ox right before the finish line and crossed. Crafty little rat. Even in ancient China, you couldn't trust a rat. Can't trust a rat, man. Not to this day, not to this time. I wonder... Do you wonder if that's where the where the phrase comes from? Never trust a rat? Yeah, or like, you know, this the general sentiment of being like, oh, that person's a rat if they're dishonest. Well, I mean, I think rats have kind of been hated throughout history because, they, they, you know, they bear disease. <laughs> the plague. They're such. ugly. Yeah. Kind of gross tails. <laughs> they do have those weird long tails. <laughs> did, did you have a kid in high school who had a rat? Yeah. Yeah, everyone did. Oh, wait. A rat or a rat tail? Oh. Like the hairstyle. Oh. I thought that's where you were either, going with either that. Either one. No, I never knew anyone that owned a rat, but I did know people that had the rat tail haircut, which... That unto itself, maybe not trust them. Yeah, well, my cousins in New Jersey, they uh, they they were rocking the rat tail for Still quite have some the rat time. Tail. <laughs> a, a little past uh, a little past expiration date on the rat tail. They don't still have it, but they the late nineties they were still rocking the rat tail. <laughs> they held the flag. No, no, I'm talking two thousands, two thousands, my friend. <laughs> Fantastic. But anyway, so so that's how the calendar happened. It's the order in which the animals finish. Those are. The 12 animals of the Zodiac, the rooster. Impressive story, man. Well, do you know where the rooster finished? 10th. He did finish 10th. Yeah. Do you know who finished last? Ooh. No. It's the pig. He stopped to get a snack, and he he didn't make it over the finish line. (laughs) He literally went and and pigged out, so everyone else beat him. He might have also saw... Because 10th is is kind of... You're not going to even get a bronze with 10th, right? You're you're kind of out of it. And I'm the year... I am the year of the rooster. You are the year of the rooster. I was born in 81, and that's the year of the rooster as well. Cock a doodle dooly. Oh! Did not see that coming, man. (laughs) No. So... Where is where is this a huge deal? So China, as we mentioned, it is Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, 
Vietnam, amongst others. But these are big trading places, which is why mm -hmm. I mentioned them. We also have celebrations, obviously. Not to mention, big trading places, specific, and this goes back to our industry knowledge stuff. Huge trading, they're huge trading partners for the retail industry. Absolutely. And that's key, because the U.S. being more of a raw commodity, even if we had this holiday, still wouldn't be that big of an impact because we're exporting raw commodities and we're not doing a ton of manufacturing here. Over there, you're looking at major raw importing and manufactured finished goods exporting out of there. So you're talking huge impact on the trade. Yeah. I for mean, the global, global economy. I mean, Chinese New Year is celebrated in the U.S. in cities like New York, our own Boston, San Francisco, Seattle, of course. They, they have big Chinese New Year parades, but it isn't a national holiday. It doesn't, it doesn't shut everything down yeah. in quite the way that it does in China. And we'll kind of get into the impact of that. But just to just give you a little background to anyone who's, who's listening on Chinese New Year is not totally familiar with it. It's, uh, it's a tradition. So their New Year's Eve there is, not too different than ours. Part of, they they make dumplings, they eat food, families get together. One of the traditions too, and this is one of the, the funnier ones, is if you don't stay up, if you're younger, if you don't stay up late on New Year's Eve, you are wishing bad health upon your elders. <laughs> I have heard these things. <laughs> and I guess this might tie back to the traditional story of, of how Chinese New Year began, but... Well, we'll get to that in a second, because I, I have a few more things to just kind of cover real quick here. So many travel, as we mentioned, many travel great distances. In China, most of the factories are on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. It's an economy of migrant workers. A lot of people live in central China or western China, so they travel great distances to get to these factories to work there to begin with. Mm -hmm. So to accommodate that, employers generally let workers leave a week or two in advance to to make their travel arrangements to get out to see their family. And the reason being is, A, as odd as it sounds, China is a bit of a worker's economy in the sense that if you wanted to leave a little bit early to see your family, see they, they didn't let you, but you wanted to, you could come back to another factory. They're going to be looking after the new year. Mm -hmm. And the reason is a lot of people save up their money throughout the year. They'll work for multiple years within a factory. Then they'll go back to their village on Chinese New Year. Mm -hmm. And they won't return to work for several years. Or they'll help tend to the family. If they have young grandchildren, they'll help out with that. They'll nag their children to make sure that, you know, they're getting, they're getting uh, hitched and married and helping propagate the bloodline. <laughs> and I was, I was reading, a, I was reading a very funny thing about this. So there's a lot of pressure that is involved with, with Chinese New Year for the youth in China. So. What'll, what'll happen to appease nagging Nance uncles, grandparents, and parents is there's a big market for a dating rental app in China. Dating rental? Yeah. So, so how this works, Ryan, is you, you would go on the app and you would rent a girlfriend if you were single and you're going home to see your family. Because if you went home alone, they would nag the hell out of you, wondering when you're going to have children, <laughs> letting you know that you're going to die alone, letting you know that you will be forever alone, Ryan. Well, there's nothing that celebrates a holiday like telling someone they're going to die alone. Yeah. Nothing. I guess, you know, in a lot of ways... It's not too undifferent than maybe Thanksgiving in the U.S. in that sense, right? If you people start, but I guess it's a there's a <laughs> lot there's a lot more pressure there, and you have a lot of people you're only seeing once a year at, yeah. at these events. So what else happens on Chinese New Year? It's a big you make your dumplings, you, you stay up late to protect your elders, you have your fake girlfriend with you. When you see your family, they're going to hand you some red envelopes, and inside those envelopes is money. But do not open that in front of your elders or whomever handles it to you. It could be your parents. It could be your grandparents. It could be your employer. In China, this is used as kind of a year-end bonus for a lot of employees, these, these red envelopes. And they're usually in denominations of eight because eight is a sign of good luck in China. Mm -hmm. And when you, you get your envelope, one piece of etiquette for you if someone hands this to you. I don't know if you've worked with, with uh, Chinese coworkers. And what you should do when someone gives you a red envelope is you should bow to them mm -hmm. and not open it until they're gone. Okie dokie. So unlike in the United States, right, where if someone handed you a gift right now, I would expect you to open it and see your reaction and, and all that kind of thing. Not not in China. Yeah. Very um, very uh, close to the vest when it comes to, uh, you know, emotional response and such like that. Learned that from uh, not Chinese, but Taiwanese in my current company. We had a uh, co-worker who lost a family member and passed away. And uh, they were telling me, they were like, you know, the 
Taiwanese culture, it's it's actually considered rude to wish them condolences. It's like you're not supposed to talk about it at all. Don't say you're sorry. Just act as if it didn't happen. And I was blown away by it. So continuing on a morbid trend about dying alone and then <laughs> the death culture, I will say they play a... Uh, the Asian culture plays the emotional uh, tip a little close to the vest. Well, you, you mentioned so, uh, spirits are, are a big thing there. So one thing that most families will do before the spring festival, before Chinese New Year, is clean their homes. And that will help bring in good luck. It'll sweep out all the bad luck. It'll sweep out all the bad spirits. Mm-hmm. And it'll make their, their home look nice. But that, that's that's a big it's like spring cleaning in the U.S. that some people yeah. do. This is that's kind of marked by this. I need to get someone in here and clean out my my ghost. Well, well Chinese that's New right. Year is a bit of a catch-all because then they have the big actual New Year celebration, and the New Year celebration is much bigger than than kind of our own. But it's marked by the same things. It's got fireworks. It's got parades. Yeah. A big part of their parades is the dancing lions, which is usually two people in a a paper mache mask costume that has fur attached to it, and they it's do the lions. They're not dragons. They there's lions? there's two Ryan, oh. but the lions are there because the lions ward away, then they protect the people from the evil spirit Nyan. Ah. The dragons, what they represent is good luck and bounty. Because do you know what dragons do, Ryan? Breathe fire? No. Oh. They fly above the, the clouds and they cause rain to happen. Huh. So they bring good luck and bounty for the crops. And when they're doing the traditional dragon dance, the more people they have within the Chinese dragon, the better luck it's supposed to be. There you have it. So pretty fantastic. Is it me or did this turn into like a like a like a Nickelodeon special, man? I feel like this has been like an educational like like this is how you teach children culture. I, I like it, man. Well, I want to teach you some culture, Ryan. <laughs> have you been to China? I have. Where'd you go? Uh, I went to Xiamen, Ningbo, Shanghai. Uh, I forget. There was a fourth one. I forget. But I went to all the major port cities because I was on a ship at the time. But you did not go during Chinese New Year, did you? No. If you're on a ship, you really can't. <laughs> no, no, you can't. You'd you'd be at the water, but you would. It would probably not be that great of an idea to to go for Chinese New Year either. Anyway, not me. Having having no ghosts with me to clean out or elders to protect, it would not be ideal for Ryan. Well, the party doesn't stop there, Ryan. The party doesn't stop with just the parades. Really? No. It it continues on, and the last day is the Lantern Festival. And from what I've heard mm-hmm. and what I've read, that is a lot of people's favorite day of. Of the Chinese of the Chinese New Year of the entire celebration, it's when they say goodbye to family, when they embark back to their villages, and they release a, a bunch of lanterns as mm-hmm. a as a thank you to to the gods and, and for a bounty and for a great new year and, and for hope for the year coming forward. Okie dokie. Sounds good. Yeah, so it's it's a mishmash of 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 kind of You've got elements of Halloween in there. You have elements of Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's Eve, and even and even Easter. So when you put all this together, you have the nightmare before Christmas. <laughs> you also have Chinese New Year, but very, very similar. It's Tim Burton's own when Chinese you, New Year. <laughs> when you put t- that would be a good movie. I'd watch that movie. I would watch that one, too. Yeah. So we mentioned that. So we've mentioned Nian. We've mentioned these dragons. And, and we mentioned spirits and, and how there's a bit of mythology there. But mm-hmm. So what is the tradition? What is the mythology? Well, I don't know. Do you know, Tim? Glad you asked. Legend goes that many moons ago, a mythical beast known as Nian lived in the mountains of mainland China. The Nian is a fearsome beast with the looks, cunning, and ferocity of a lion, the strength of an ox, and the horn and mythical powers of a unicorn. Every year as the new moon crept towards spring, Nian would come out from his lair and terrorize the villagers. Nian would destroy their homes. The elders would fall victim to Nian's bite, and children would be snatched away, never to be seen again. The villagers tried everything to keep the monster from their door. They'd lay offerings of food and crops, but none of it would satiate the savage Nian. Hiding became their only hope for survival. However, one year, an elder remained in the village, for he would not hide. His people pleaded with him to save himself, but he would not go. He stayed right there in the village. He held his ground. He was the bravest elder in China. And he waited for the Nian to strike. The villagers thought he was insane. So they went. They went into hiding. They left him alone. And what did he do? Well, when the people came back the next day, 
they were surprised to find him alive. They said, how did you avoid Nian? Nian should have gotten you. You're the only person here. And he showed them. What he did, Ryan, is he made a lot of loud noises. <laughs> he painted his house red. He hung, he, hung up, he hung up red lanterns. And he hung up red scrolls with sayings on them. Uh, oh, I was right. Sayings. He had his yeah. own lantern festival. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there would be sayings like, like foo. And if you turn foo upside down, it means, it means a great bounty. And he, these were on his walls. So they killed him with, with loud noise, the color red, the power of positivity. Mm-hmm. And... From that day forward, Nian never came back. Okay, so, okay. <laughs> that is why the Chinese New Year celebration is marked by fireworks, which make the loud noises and the lanterns and and the color red, which is a national color to begin with, but it, it's also used as a part of the celebration, super traditional Chinese color. Gotcha. So that's what it stems from. That's, that's basically Chinese New Year. In a nutshell, they fearsome demon. Fearsome demon. Turned away by lanterns, red paint, and fireworks. Yeah. I'm with you. Well, Ryan, these days, people no longer fear Neon. Because there's much greater menaces, like those those nosy aunts and uncles that we mentioned before for the dateless Chinese man and the dateless Chinese woman. Reminding you, you're going to die alone. You're going to die alone. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> what does this have to do with trade? <laughs> I will never have grandchildren. Well, I'm going to get to that because you know what? You know what the biggest thing to fear now about Chinese New Year is, Ryan? What's that? Your cargo getting rolled. Oh, true. Space availability becomes a massive issue when it comes to Chinese New Year, my friend. Or the CNY, as we in the business abbreviate it down to. So what happens in the shipping industry as Chinese New Year approaches? Well, the simplest answer is that you develop space availability issues is the only way to really describe it. There's... A term that we use often when we're talking about trade in general is capacity. And when we say capacity, we're talking about space on the vessels. All of the vessels that are used in the Trans-Pacific trade have hundreds of thousands of TEU space available. That's the capacity. There's a massive current overcapacity in the industry, which is causing all of the horrible trends as far as rates go, as far as companies going out of business. That's really the crux issue or the core issue there the real crux of it is the overcapacity now as we start coming into the chinese new year there's a couple of different things happening like i mentioned the asian countries are predominantly they have a lot of imports and a lot of exports but predominantly you're talking about raw material coming in and finished goods going out so you're talking about toy companies clothing companies retail of all kinds is counting on southeast asia predominantly now but also other places located in china all the way up into north china and japan What's going to be big when it comes to retailers? Christmas in the U.S. We're consumers. We're a consumer nation. That's what we do. That's what we're good at. So as we start getting into the months of July, August, you start seeing the ramp up where everybody wants to ship and everyone wants to import their goods to the U.S. So getting space out of, let's just say China, just for the sake. But when I'm saying China, I'm also going to include Southeast Asia and North Asia. But China to the U.S. starts to get a little tight. Week to week, you're going to have a little struggle getting your freight on the boat. As you start to roll into the Christmas holiday, so December 25th week, things start to slow down. We're not really in, we don't really do overstock that much anymore in our industry, excuse me, in the retail industry in America now. We've become very much attached to the just-in-time model. So space is tight, but not overly tight when you're coming into the Christmas season here in the U.S. from China. Then you come into Chinese New Year. A year like this, the Chinese New Year was on the earlier side. So there was really no break in between what we call the peak season rush going from the end of the summer into the winter months, Q3 into Q4, and then going from Q4 to Q1, it runs right into the Chinese New Year. So to the topic we're speaking of, you take an already small capacity situation where you have more volume than you have capacity available on a week-to-week basis, and then you add more volume, not because there's more volume to be moved, but because everyone's rushing to get the volume out of the country on the import side to America, and on the export side from America to China, they're trying to either get it into the country before the new year or trying to find a way that they can hold inventory and find slower routes so that they, it gets there after the new year. So there's all kinds of space availability issues. It's the only time of the year where you're going to have trouble getting something on a boat. <laughs> so you mentioned a term, overcapacity. Yes. 
what does that what does that mean in layman's terms? Is it, is it like a hotel vacancy, no vacancy? What does overcapacity mean? Because it sounds to me, Ryan, like there's too many containers on the ship. No capacity in terms of capacity. The word capacity in our industry refers to the space on a vessel. So if you think of it like, imagine a ship made out of Legos. And then you're building containers out of Legos as well and putting them on your Lego ship. The space that you're using for your Lego containers, each one of those represents 1% of the capacity. So as the capacity for our industry has continued to increase by larger ships being built, we've created, quote, overcapacity situations. There's too much available space out there, and there's not nearly enough cargo to move on these vessels. And because of that, it has what some might call a negative, some might call a positive, depending on which side of the scale you're sitting on, but it causes a lot of different economical and financial challenges for the shipping industry as a whole, as well as retailers, actually. It does have a ripple effect into the industries that import and export, but as we're talking about the trade and transportation business, as far as shippers are concerned, overcapacity is the bane of our existence. So how do the steamship lines deal with this? Do they you would think that if you don't have capacity, you would you would lower prices or you would do something to create an, some type of demand, create an artificial demand. What is the process that that they go through? Well, it's kind of a loaded question there because I wouldn't say so much of it as a process so much as it's uh, multiple ideas of how to approach this. You know, one of the uh, solutions, I guess, for lack of a better term, but really one of the processes that you might go through is trying to engage in vessel sharing agreements as opposed to everyone having their own vessel. And a vessel sharing agreement being, take currently the alliance that the company I work for, Yang Ming, is engaged in was known as the CKYHE Alliance. That was Costco, Yang Ming, K-Line, Hanjin, and Evergreen all got together and essentially rented space on each other's vessels. So you had one loop of ports that you went to, you know, Shanghai, Ningbo, North China ports, going all the way over to the through the Panama Canal into the East Coast and hitting all of the U.S. East Coast and Boston ports. As a product of that, you had limited capacity available to each one of the individual shipping lines because you took one boat and divided into 20% wedges each. Everybody got a fifth of the boat, say. It's not exact, but that's good for an example. That's one of your approaches that you're going to take. The reason you want to take that is because, like we said, overcapacity is bad because if you always have open space on your vessel, you're going to want to fill that with some cargo. Having something ship in a space as opposed to nothing is always preferable because operating costs of a vessel are high, so you need to you know, it's essentially, it's like getting gas money. If you have a, if you have a giant SUV and you're going on a road trip, it's better to have five people in the car with you than one person in the car with you because you can divvy up gas money. It's essentially the same concept. Operating costs are distributed throughout the group in the Alliance so that people can develop profit from each individual cargo that's being put on the vessel. But Ryan, I'm an importer and my broker just sent me an email saying that I owe $500 more on the containers that they quoted me because of something called a GRI. <laughs> Indeed. A GRI, or as we may know it, a general rate increase. <laughs> okay, all kidding aside, GRIs are unfortunate when it comes to being an end, end user. And this is why I say there is a good and a bad to this. Take it a step back, going back to the overcapacity thing. Overcapacity benefits retailers in the short term because they'll be able to get shipping costs absolutely at dirt cheap rates. Take uh, last year at this time, the rate from China to the U.S. East Coast was around anywhere between $1,700 and $1,900 for any one of the major importers. If you were Bed Bath & Beyond, that's what you were getting for a rate. That's pretty dirt cheap when you think about it. Less than $2,000 to go all the way from one side of the world to the other when only four or five years ago, it was up around like 3000 That's almost a 50% reduction in the cost. Sure. Well, if you, if you look back too, to 2011, there were 13 GRIs instituted and held mm -hmm. throughout the year. That right now seems quite unheard of, correct? Oh, yeah. Well, that's why... It, let, me, uh, let me continue with that thought real quick and get back... But I'll circle back to that because you bring up a good point about the GRI sticking versus not. And sticking is a term that I use loosely, and that just means that 
if you propose a GRI, it actually gets implemented. So you have the dirt cheap rate of $1,700 for an importer going from China to the U.S. East Coast. That is below operating cost for a shipping company's per container cost, meaning every single box that you ship, you're not actually making money on. In a lot of cases, you're losing money in that case. Well, this is where we come to the GRIs. A GRI, or general rate increase, is a proposed rate increase that has to be legally has to be notified to all of the you know, customers, all the people you hold contracts with, and to the general market 30 days in advance. And the way it does is there was actually, uh, I believe today's the today we're actually recording this on January 31st, there was actually an announcement made for a March 1st GRI on the Trans-Pacific Westbound, the export trade. That GRI is announced. Over the course of the month now, we will work with our customers to find out what the rest of the competitors in the market are going to be implementing. We proposed $80 for a 20 and $100 for a 40. If our competitor, if our competition comes out and says, we're only going to pick $25 for a 20 and $50 for a 40. Let's face facts. We're going to have to go down to that because we have to compete. Otherwise, we're going to lose the container and we won't be able to ship anything there. So that's where we get into the GRI sticking and everything. A GRI will only stick if everyone holds the line, so to speak, if everyone offers the GRI and maintains it. But because of the overcapacity scenario that we're in for the majority of the year, there's always going to be somebody that blinks. Somebody's going to say, I can offer it to you for a couple of dollars less. And in this business, it's a small world. And that information gets out very fast. So are you trying to tell me that my broker isn't trying to price gouge me because his, his quote was 1200 from Shanghai to New York. And as I mentioned that email, mm -hmm. he wants almost 50% more with that $500 general rate increase. Your broker is most likely not trying to gouge you. I can't say that definitively because brokers are also aware that GRIs are going to come out. And since these GRIs are published, people know what the GRI initially was, but it's not necessarily published specifically what the GRI was mitigated down to. That's a deal between the vendor, steamship line, and the contractee or buyer, whoever you're working with. So if we say, take for instance, Say that GRI was published at $500. It might have been mitigated down to $250. Your broker, however, may still enforce the $500, figuring there's an extra $250 to be put in the pocket. Now, mm. most brokers are pretty upstanding people. 99% of brokers are not going to do that because it's a quick way to get a bad reputation and lose all of your business. So, realistically, probably it's just a $500 charge that's or general rate increase, GRI, that's been rolled from the carrier to the broker, and the broker probably doesn't have enough profit margin built in to eat that, so they have to pass it on to the end shipper or end consignee, you in this particular case. But we're, we're talking about the price here, and, and my particular one is $500. So you're talking about, so are you saying that it's because the freight is so depressed to begin with that it makes the GRI look a lot greater than it actually is? Oh, absolutely. And not to mention that is I'd go so far as to say that the GRIs that are rolled out are so significant because it's done on the basis that it's unlikely that it's actually going to hold. So you ask for a 500 GRI knowing full well that the likelihood of you actually keeping a $500 rate increase is very low. Ask for 500 if you can get away with 250, at least you got 250 type of thing. If you ask for 250, you might only get away with 100. So rolling out big GRIs, it's not a price gouging thing, it's an effort to try and equalize the market, to try and get us back to an operating cost that actually breaks even. I'll tell you, there is a period of time, probably about six months after uh, after contract season, for about six months steady, there's a GRI rolled out on every single trade lane every single month. And every time I go into a customer's office, they always say the same thing. Why are there so many GRIs? Why are there so many GRIs? Sure. And the simple answer is because the customer will beat you up on the rate because they can get it cheaper someplace else. And they drive the rate down to an absolutely ungodly, unmaintainable level. Well, good. So you, you mentioned that, speaking of the rates, you mentioned that there's mitigation that goes on with these GRIs. Who mitigates them? What do you mean? Who like negotiates the mitigation? Yeah, who negotiates or? them down? Who decides if they stick? Who decides where that number finally ends up? Traditionally, in most steamship lines, because, I mean, let's face facts, that's where the GRI is coming from. It's coming directly from a steamship line. Yeah. Most steamship lines have trade departments. Actual people that sit either in their headquarters overseas or the headquarters in the U.S. 
and they make the decision on what the rate is going to be. They're the ones that give the salespeople their marching orders, so to speak, to say, okay, go out and be customer facing, but these are the prices that we're moving at right now. So the decision on whether or not a rate can be approved or a mitigation of a GRI can be approved comes from the trade department's final say. However, it's the salesperson, take Ryan Dooley sales manager's job, to be the person between the customer and the trade department and actually divining what does the customer actually willing to pay and what do they actually really need the rate to land at. So the negotiation is conducted with the salesperson, but the final say is going to come from the trade department sitting in an office in either New York, New Jersey, or an overseas, you know, Hong Kong, Taiwan in our case, Okay. Tokyo. You know, maybe my broker wasn't trying to screw me there. Maybe I need to apologize to him via email. And he wasn't trying to get me with the GRI. But you know what? A couple months ago, he put something else on there. And I believe it was back in August. It was something called a PSS. <laughs> what yes. is that, right? <laughs> That's your peak season surcharge, which huh. is essentially that is a time that is a time locked GRI is essentially what that is. So a GRI, when you're rolling out a general rate increase, that's a rate increase that won't be implemented until a set time, but then it carries forth, and that's part of the rate for all perpetuity, or actually for the rate for the length of the contract. That is, a PSS or peak season surcharge is a GRI that's time locked on the sense that you will implement a GRI and it'll have a window labeled either August first through November thirtieth. That means that GRI will be applied during that period of time, and then at the end of at the end of November thirtieth the rate reverts back to the level it was prior to the PSS being applied. Now, I feel like the next question is going to be, why even have that little temporary GRI? (laughs) And the simple and easy fact, I mean, the quick down and dirty of it is, it's a cash grab. It's an effort to try and take advantage, as we talked about a little bit here, is that period of time is heavy on volume when it comes to containers. That period of time is going to be where everyone's actually going to make their money. And... One of the, you know, savvy, somewhat ethically gray areas, in my opinion, is picking a time where you know everyone needs to get their freight and then saying, no problem, we can do it, but we're going to do it at a higher price. So what you so what you're saying is that overcapacity will drive the rates down. So if a, a box is going to a 40 foot container is going to the West Coast for eight hundred dollars, the point of the GRIs is to get it back to a prop. A level of profitability, say you want that to be $1,200, you might institute several $200 GRIs to get it up to that level without, I guess, sticker shocking mm-hmm. your your customer right out of their, their shoes. Because I guess the harder you come at them, the more they're going to, to push back during these mitigation periods, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty reasonable explanation. And I it's there's multiple schools of thought on this. Um, I myself, I fall to the school of thought that You should lay out a GRI plan that's non-negotiable and say, okay, instead of us going for $500 GRIs every two months and then mitigating, what if we opted to GRI increase every month non-negotiable for the next six months? That way, at the end of six months, we have the $600 increase that we're looking for. However, you as a retailer can make your plan as far as how you want to price your materials and how you want to lay out your you know, operating cost or P&L or whatever you guys whatever you guys want to use as your bottom line matrix. And I personally think that's the better model. A lot of people disagree and a lot of people say it doesn't work. So because there's always going to be someone that will come in and say, well, you know what, I'll waive it for that month. And that gives them one month off of that rate. So there's always going to be a little something, a little competition there. I think the long-term planning model is better for everyone because people can actually figure out when they're going to make their money and be able to schedule accordingly. But the other school of thought being is that roll out big ones, mitigate down, and just try to do it on a month-to-month basis. I find it, I can't even imagine. I've never been on the retail side, the end constantly retail side, so I can't even imagine how they go through that process because that's got to be a nerve-wracking thing to be like, ah, shoot, it may or may not go up $100 this month. <laughs> well, and, and as we just learned from you as, you, as you informed us, demand drives the market. What does the GRI and PSS have to do with Chinese New Year? Do we see them more often this time of year? Oh, yeah. Well, the PSS comes right before Chinese New Year every year because the peak season is going to be right before Chinese New Year. When you roll into the Chinese New Year, when we'll put it this way, when Chinese New Year is close to the peak season, it's also not uncommon for steamship lines to come and say, okay, I know the peak season was going to end on 1130, that November 30th, that is. 
what if we extend that peak season surcharge for another two months and guarantee space on the vessel? So is the peak season, a, is that a set number of months or, or days or how does the peak season function? On a, it's on a case by case, but oh, not case, but it's on a steamship by steamship line basis. Our peak season of, I mean, traditionally it goes from it's Q4 is essentially the peak season. That's pretty much the extent of it. But if a steamship line wants to make it shorter or longer, they're at their discretion to do so. Yeah. I mean, it's realistically, they could choose a peak season in the middle of nowhere. They could say, oh, you have a seasonal product that is only really popular between May and June. So we're going to say your peak season is May and June. And then we'll apply a peak season surcharge there. It's unlikely because it doesn't really work. Eventually, that customer would become frustrated with that model. But it's, it's possible. It can be done. So Chinese New Year can be a humongous headache for, for importers, and there's a multitude of reasons. One of them we covered a little bit earlier when we were talking about what Chinese New Year is. There's a lot of workers who, who work in factories. They're migrant workers. Mm -hmm. They, as we also mentioned, they leave weeks early. They leave weeks in advance. They're usually not back for a week after because they have to obviously travel back to the factory if they come back if too. they come back or they might come back to another factory they're gonna have new staff new training is going to happen production is not instantaneous it's not kind of like the u.s where you know we have new year's eve and then it's it's back to business on january 2nd sure i mean here but so kind of it so a confluence of things and i'm, I'm trying to bring this all together and the the sort of debacle that happens from the import department if i'm an importer is here we have around December 15th ish, you, you start to see our staffs getting a little bit slower, people going away for the holidays, crews getting smaller. But then, as you know, when the importers get back to work on January 2nd, mm -hmm. it immediately becomes, where's my freight? Yeah. <laughs> Is it getting rolled? Is it getting on the vessel? So, my question to you, as someone who works for a steamship line, is if I am working in the import department, for a BCO or even just a small importer, what can I do to help mitigate some of the, uh, the the difficulties that will arise with Chinese New Year? What are what are what's your survival guide for Chinese New Year? That's a pretty good question, and I got to tell you, if I had the silver bullet, I guess I'd probably uh, write a book and ride off into the sunset with my millions. But I can tell you my recommendations here, and one of the quick things there, just uh, to make sure that everyone's following what we're saying. I know we gave the clarification of the NVO being the non-vessel operated common carrier and the BCO being the beneficial cargo owner. BCO being the end consignee, say Bed Bath & Beyond. That's a BCO. Big companies. Yes. Bose, Absolutely. Nike, huge, huge companies bringing thousands of, here's another acronym, TEUs. Mm -hmm. What is a TEU, Ryan? That is a 20-foot equivalent unit, sir. Which is quite simply just what? It's, well... A container. Yeah. That's it. Well, a 20-foot container. Well, yeah, 20-foot container. Yeah. Or half of a 40-foot container. <laughs> yeah. So what's a 40-foot container called? Domestically called an FEU. It is. Yeah. Internationally, they still... See, that's always been a funny thing to me is that domestically we use FEUs. Internationally, we use TEUs. Now, the equation's pretty basic is that one FEU equals two TEUs. But it always just struck me as odd that it's like, you know, like English versus metric. Why do we have to be different? Yeah. Why can't we just have a uniform system? Well, and also, I mean, I, I guess to, you always want to use kind of a smaller denomination, but in freight, the more popular thing is obviously the 40-foot container. So most of the time, I guess you're multiplying by two. Yeah, it's I, I got to tell you, and more problems have been caused by signing contracts for what you think is going to be 2,000 FEUs, and it turns out it's 2,000 TEUs, so now you're only getting 1,000 containers. Ooh, that's a 50% <laughs> discount right there, buddy. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> But um, back it, to your point there about um it, about I'm sorry. Were you no, gonna... I was gonna say. So so what do I do? Um, your survival guide. Let's let's kind of start from the perspective again that that I'm the importer. When do I want my goods done at a factory and ready to go to port? How far in advance do I need to have these there, Ryan? Before you tell me that they got bumped. Well, the important thing to remember is that it's gonna take it's gonna take you about a month. You're gonna have about a four week transit time to come from China to the U S. Okay, so. Realistically, as long as your cargo is on the terminal prior to the New Year's Eve, what we call it the New Year's Eve cutoff, or excuse me, the Chinese New Year cutoff, when the terminals start shutting down, as long as your cargo is on the terminal prior to then, you'll be fine because it will be loaded. 
The problem you're going to have, though, is that as the terminal starts shutting down, they've implemented a new rule as of, I want to say it was November 9th or December 9th, they implemented a new rule in Shanghai. It used to be, okay, then we'll just drop, the steamship line would cut a deal with the customer, you could drop as much cargo as you wanted, and it would either get on the vessel, and if not, it would get rolled to the next vessel, which wouldn't be until after the new year, so it would just sit on the terminal, no extra fees, and it would just be loaded on the next vessel, no problem. Shanghai implemented a rule, you couldn't roll more than 30 units. So that's 30 FEUs, 30 TUs, whatever this case may be, but you couldn't roll more than 30. So there was a lot of people that, if you didn't ship it beforehand, it was sitting on your dock, which becomes a problem because there are some of these companies that the workers don't come back, and now you have cargo that's stuck and can't even get to the port. So there's a bunch of the different hmm. problems to take into consideration. My personal recommendation, and it's one of those things that, I mean, we're talking about a macro level global change to make, is that you need to start gradually increasing the volume that you're exporting out of a country like China. Importing to the U.S. is the equation that we're looking at right now. If you're going to be importing, you really need to start during the peak season of increasing your volumes. The only way that you can do that, though, is devise near concrete projections and provide them to the steamship lines because steamship lines are going to give preference to regular bookings. If you book out in advance with me 12 weeks, if you book three months out and you have 10 containers shipping every week for 12 weeks, I, as the salesperson have the ammunition needed to speak to my trade to make sure that you can always get on the boat. That's a good way to lock in your space. If you only ship one box with me this week, that week, this week, and then all of a sudden you need 20 boxes to ship, no way that's going to happen. It just doesn't work. So your first step, devise solid projections. Provide as much advance notice as you can to the steamship lines. On top of that, if you can start increasing earlier, that's always a better plan just because there's going to come to a point where there flat out is not enough space on any boats. And then when stuff does get rolled, then you're realistically going to want to work in advance with the steamship lines to find out exactly how much they are actually going to be able to take. Because the next scenario that you're going to run into is, okay, we can't get on a ship. What do we do with the excess inventory? Do you load it into the container and take it to the port? Do you load it into the container and hold it at your location? Or do you not load the container, not take the equipment out, and leave yourself some space as far as your yard goes or whatever, your individual facility. Like I said, there's no easy solution to how to fix it. If there was one, I'm sure we would have we would have come across it right now. But my best recommendations or my survival guard is get your information together, get it out as early as possible, share it as much as possible. The transparency is key when it comes to steamship lines. People that think they're going to find a loophole and I'm not going to tell the steamship line this and then I'm going to try and like sneak it in at the end never works. At best, it creates a acrimonious relationship between the consignee and the steamship line. So Ryan, let's say you're an importer who doesn't have a direct contract with a steamship line. You don't have a contact there. You're Let's say you're only doing 240 TUs a year. So you got your 10 containers a month. Chinese New Year is rapidly approaching. Who would someone in that situation reach out to? I would say that you would go to your NVOCC or broker, any of the third-party logistics par- parties that would be able to negotiate with the with the carrier on your behalf and because i don't have the buying power of these these bigger the bed and bats of the world should i go to them sooner than perhaps bed and bat should or is this because of overcapacity is this a situation where it's not so much a problem getting on the boat it's more of a timing issue you have to be at the port at a certain time to be perfectly honest i wish there was a good answer for that but i mean it's it's really hit or miss depending on which third party that you choose to use because again this goes back to long-range projections will take precedent long-range projections that have actually been made good on meaning you booked out a couple hundred a month and you actually showed up with a couple hundred containers each month will take priority over a random 3pl that just shows up and wants to make a booking that's the reason why you have take kuna nagel boc you know ch robinson you take all these big name 3pls that's why they do so well is because they have such a strong reputation that if you're a smaller BCO and you're using an MVO contract, you are better served by going to one of them because they're more likely to be able to get space because they have the stronger reputa- stronger reputation. Not necessarily predicated on buying power, but they have a more consistent booking pattern so that you're able to be a part of that. So let's say I miss the boat, Ryan. How screwed am I? When would I... So Chinese New Year, January 28th this year. 
It's going to end in 15 days. What do I do next? In the scenario, you're saying that you were not able to get on the boat prior to the new year? That's yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, it's, 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 it's waiting to get on a boat. Well, I mean, don't kid yourself when we say that these that the workers don't necessarily come back. I mean, the Chinese workforce does. Just the specific companies are in a bit of turmoil post-New Year. So there is a little bit of a delay sometimes. But, I mean, it will get loaded and it will – the process will continue. The machine will go back to work. Um, there's no There's no hidden formula to tell you what to do to improve your scenario on that. In that case – you just want to stay on top of it, either staying on top of your 3PL or staying on top of your you know, local sales rep for the direct steamship line, if that's your if that's your particular case, to find out what the ETA is as far as next available vessel, loading plans, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for sorting things out. Things slow down because so many people try to get out before the new year. You know, since the Chinese New Year has hit, we really haven't had a whole tremendous amount of you know people concerned with that because there will be space on the vessels. Everything starts to slow down as far as volumes of cargo. It'll be a little bit easier. So once you get there, there's a certain, even if you have missed the boat, there's a certain amount of stress relief because it will get on the next vessels. There will be availability. There won't be quite as much over, you know, there won't be quite as much excess volume filling up that overcapacity scenario and creating space availability issues because there won't be the old cargo on top of incoming weekly cargo the weekly cargo volumes will start to slow down so the excess cargo that was already on terminal will start to filter its way on faster than it would prior to the new year so it's a good it's a good filter system there once you get past the new year okay but i'm still going to have to wait several weeks before that leaves the port i wouldn't say several weeks okay maybe a week oh just a week yeah i mean can't put that in gospel but i mean yeah it's not It's not one of those things where it's like, yeah, it'll be four weeks before we can roll it out. I mean, even before the new year, it shouldn't be more than a week or so as far as rolls go. I mean, most most steamship lines have their policy where if you didn't make it on this vessel, you are now priority for the next vessel. I guess I would imagine, too, that congestion wouldn't be that huge of an issue because nobody else in China was bringing cargo to the port either. Exactly. There's not continually adding weekly volume building up on top of existing volume so you're more just filtering through the existing volume with a limited amount of weekly volume starting to come back in okay so as you mentioned some of the things that an importer can do to to make cargo run smoothly in chinese new year and not let it become a nightmare would be to a get your bookings in early Mm -hmm. communicate with the steamship line if you have a contract or a contact with them Mm -hmm. or your broker or your nvo whomever's booking your freight whoever your direct freight contact is sure let them know about your shipments that are coming. Let them know the windows that are there so you can realistically project to your buyers when goods are going to be there so your inventory analyst can know all of that kind of stuff. Be mindful that a PSS is going to hit beforehand, so be sure to include that in your, your cost model. Understand that GRIs may or may not stick. Mm-hmm. That's another thing that can get you right around this time of year. Is there anything else that you could think of perhaps that would be beneficial to an importer or an exporter? As the Chinese New Year approaches. No, I think we touched on pretty much all the major key points. I would add the only other thing that also helps you during the Chinese New Year is that just because you can get low rates building up to it is not necessarily the best model. What I've found the most successful uh, importer and exporters look at what is the lowest rate in the market and then add 10 to 15% on top of it and take that rate. That does not guarantee but it gives you a more likelihood of being loaded on the vessel without being rolled or having a booking rejected. Because that's another thing that's happening now, too. We didn't mention it, but rolling being you were booked on this vessel, there's not enough space for you, you're now going to get rolled to the following vessel. What a lot of the companies are doing now, mine included, we don't like rolls. Rolls show up as a negative on our KPIs, our key point indicators on how we do as a steamship line. So what we started to do is, if we're not sure we can get it on the boat, just reject the booking and don't allow someone to book with you which has the exact same effect, you're still going to be delayed. It's just instead of it being rolled, it's been rejected and you have to rebook it. If, however, you're not the, you know, China to U.S. West Coast rate of $700, if you're China to U.S. West Coast at $1,200, you're definitely getting on that boat because you have a $500 higher rate than a neighbor. 
Now that's a drastic one. I mean, the 10, 10 to 15% there in that case would be like, eh, if you were more like eight or $850, you have a more likelihood of getting on the boat as opposed to a $700 rate. Well, there you go, listeners, directly from someone who works for a steamship line and from myself who's worked for an NVOCC and for a brokerage. Those are a few ways that you can uh, survive the Chinese New Year and make it not such a headache and make it the joyful celebration it is of <laughs> destroying or, or scaring away that evil demon, that hellcat, Nyan. Nyan. <laughs> the other thing that defends against Nyan is GRIs. GRIs, GRIs scare Nyan away. Loud noises. <laughs> start yelling in your office. You will, you will, you will send him running. Just randomly start yelling at your desk. <laughs> you know they're just sort of like how there's multiple versions of the Bible. Like any origin story, there's, there's, you know, in some Nyan he lives in the mountains, and in others he lives in the sea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So no one's really sure where Nian is. Wow. There's even one tale that says he was eventually captured and, and killed by someone. Really? He was actually mounted on his wall. <laughs> oh, That's, there you go. Yeah. Walk into some China guy's house and all of a sudden you're like, is that Nian's head? That, yes, it is. <laughs> that guy would be really old, man. Yeah. Well, he passed down through the generations. Yeah. Maybe his grandson has a stuffed Nian just on the wall. How do you taxidermy a Nian? <laughs> Questions for the ages, my friend. Ancient Chinese mystery. Yeah. And as you can tell by the tone of Ryan and his voice, we, uh, we're, we're moving out of the serious talk here. And yeah. <laughs> we're moving into, uh, well, a little news, a little news about the podcast. We are now listening to Ryan in eight countries. Eight countries. Awesome. 25 states. Boom. Is Iowa one of them? It is not. And Where neither, are you, Iowa? Neither is Ohio. <laughs> we do have Idaho on there. Hey, Idaho. Yeah, that comes out of left field. How about that? Go potatoes. Ah, uh, you know, I, it's a, it's a friend of mine. I, I know he's. I like to, yeah, pass I it like on. to think he he listens yeah. to it in public forums though, so other people in Idaho are getting it as well. Yeah, he actually he owns a donkey, and he pulls a plow. <laughs> Okie dokie. I'm not sure if the donkey pulls the plow. I I never um I never I'll find out. You don't know if they're like mutually exclusive statements. Like I own a donkey and I pull a plow. Well, it's not I own a donkey that pulls a plow. Yeah, because who the hell still pulls a plow with a donkey? I don't know. Sometimes is it like one of those like. The little like wedge, like plows, like it's he just walks behind the donkey with the plow, like and the plow gets pulled through the the soil so he can till it. Th- that sounds like something JJ Watt would do for fun. It really yeah. does, doesn't it? As long as there was a camera there, yeah, yeah. As long as you got him on film, if, if just... someone from NFL Network was there or or HBO Films for <laughs> Hard Knocks, he would he would be sure to strap himself to that plow and <laughs> and pull it until they stop rolling. Hashtag crop fit. Yeah. Yeah, that's crop fit. I like that one. We should work on that. There you go, man. Oh, boy. What else do we got? Oh, we got the uh, we got upcoming events. Valentine's Day. You don't need to rent a girlfriend because you can go to the import seminar on biotech, pharma, and medical. It's a Pine Conference Center in Southboro, Mass. Nothing says I love you like a bio, pharma, conference maybe you could meet the one for you there it's from nine to five there you go so you have plenty of time afterwards if you meet mrs Wright or or mr Wright. Your eyes connect over an fda compliance rule and yeah you could scatter off into the sunset you could do my favorite date which is go to auntie annie's and share a pretzel there you go <laughs> <laughs> that's really not my favorite date but i don't know i'm trying to you know, we're an all-ages podcast here, get so... A, get a Cinnabon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a Cinnabon would be nice. There's a lot of calories in those, man. Yeah. <laughs> that is... That's the one... I mean, a benefit of cardio, obviously, is mm-hmm. that... Obviously, it burns calories. Yes. But when you spend an hour on a bike or an hour running and you and you see that it burned 400 or 600 calories, mm-hmm. then you look on the back of a package and your Cinnabon is 800 calories. Huh. You're like... Uh, no, not doing two hours for you. <laughs> that's, a, no, that's two hours on the bike. <laughs> That's that's a lot of pedaling. Um, Indeed. But yeah, that's that's the pharma one. We've covered it. If that interests you, that's there. That's in Southboro. Put on by Connect. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else we got? February 28th, 23rd annual International Business Forum and Networking Event. That goes from 5.30 to 8.30 at Morgan Lewis in Boston. Do you have the seafood show on there as well? or? Yeah, that's coming up. Well, that was your little baby. I didn't write that one down. When is the seafood show, Ryan? That's March 19th to the 21st. Right after St. Patrick's Day. That's a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday event over in the 
Seafood, excuse me, not the Seafood Expo Center, the Bay, the BCEC, the Boston Convention and Exposition Center. It's directly across from the Seaport Convention Center there. So it's actually in the Seaport District, but not actually on the water. I highly recommend, uh, I highly recommend going to that. That's an actually, that's actually a good direct sales type of place. If you're a 3PL or if you're a steamship line, there's always people there that you can talk to. Good and reefer business, and as we may or may not know, the last bastion of revenue-generating cargo is the reefer business, or refrigerated container business. Interesting. What makes you say that real quick? Well, as we talked about with the overcapacity stuff, the dry cargo, because it's just a box when it comes to dry cargo, those rates drop and tank. The reefer cargo, because it is higher value commodities, time sensitive, people are just willing to pay more for reefer commodities. And as a product of that, steamship lines, yeah, rightfully so, take advantage of that. People absolutely need their cargo, so the rates are considerably higher, roughly around four to five times as high as the current dry cargo rate in some cases. I mean, it ranges anywhere from either two to three times the dry rate to four to five times the dry rate. And that's it as far as that one goes. Ryan, I got another event for us. This is a new one that we're adding to the calendar. It is the 11th annual Wine and Tequila Tug Celebration of Social Innovation in our community. It's the biggest party in Boston tech. Tug stands for Technology Underwriting Greater Good. And that is Thursday, March 23rd, 2017 from 6.30 to 11.30 p.m. at the Innovation and Design Building. In Selfie, right? That's right by Black Falcon. Oh, is the Innovation Design... That's the design... I've always known it as the Design Center, but it's the is the official name of it the Innovation and Design Center? I believe so. Is that... Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that until right now. Huh. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's right in the seaport, right next to Black Falcon. Um, I suggest that one because this is kind of a, a tech startup one. So if you're interested in businesses that are soon to exist in Boston, Interesting. It's, a, it's a good event to check out. Like I said, they have wine and tequila there. I don't have a ton of details on it yet. I'll I'll get some more and I'll I'll tweet some to you. But um, tweet the deets. Yeah, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, March twenty third, and after that, again, we keep mentioning it because it's it's coming up. But April eleventh, twenty first annual Northeast Trade and Transportation Conference TNT. Yep, that is a three day event. Goes from April eleventh to April thirteenth at Garney's Newport Resort and Marina in Newport, Rhode okay. Island. And there you have it. That one's always a blast. Yes, it is. That's always a good time. The um, so one of the other uh, this has nothing to do with the uh with the TNT there, but it's one of the other things that I was talking to a colleague of mine here who contacted me about uh, job opportunities. Uh, have you ever used any of these recruiters that they have, like the specific logistics zip recruiter? <laughs> That's it. That's your one. That's your go-to man, huh? <laughs> I. All credit to Bill Burr. I don't know. I don't. I, oh. <laughs> I don't. What recruiter? I don't use a recruiter. No, I haven't used one yet. So there's, I mean, there's a billion of them out there. I mean, so many of them. I mean, uh, there's also Indeed.com and Monster and all these ones that you can do that are like self, yeah, yeah self motivated. Are any of them as good as Zip <laughs> Recruiter? <laughs> I have to say, like the hold on like the Bill Burr deliveries there is just priceless. But really um. Is. But no, so a couple of colleagues of mine and classmates actually from, say, Mass Maritime and King's Point and such like that, they spun off and they have these logistics, maritime, transportation, recruiting companies, Mm -hmm. such as Core Group Resources, uh, Flagship Management, and FastStream. And so I throw these out there for people that are, because like we said, we talk a little bit about people new to the industry looking for networking events and stuff. It's a great... It's a great thing that they do there. It's a it's an interesting service that they provide because they work directly with companies and they essentially take the role of vetting out candidates for the HR departments for them. So it's of no cost to the individual, but you can tell them, I want to work for a steamship line or I have these salary requirements or I have this location. And then they just contact you when there's opportunities. And the websites that they have also have whatever the current ones. So if, say, you wanted to try something completely different, you can throw your hat in the ring on all these things. And so for anyone that's new to the business 
That's... So this is national. This is oh yeah. Okay, not these just Boston are... based. Oh no, no, these ones in particular. I, tell you the truth, I don't actually know any any that are local Boston based. I know all three of the companies I just mentioned are all based in the South, as in Core Group Resources is out of Houston. Mm-hmm. Uh, flagship management and fast stream are both based out of Florida, like Fort Lauderdale area. And then there's also Shea Devonch, which is spelled S H E Y, uh, space D V O N C H. They're based out of California, but they all deal nationally. So you'll find stuff for Seattle, New York, Boston, South Carolina, Texas, California. I mean, whatever you, whatever you want, there's something there. And they also do international ones. Which is something that we discussed with, um, you and I discussed with Betty Little at one of the TNT conf- conferences, just in a passing conversation, that they were struggling at the Adidas Reebok group, trying to find younger people that are willing to take overseas postings and stuff. And so I figured I would take this opportunity to mention these because anyone that's a newcomer to the industry might be interested in taking a peruse around those, uh, around those websites and see if there's anything out there for them. Yeah, I mean, if you listen to this podcast and for whatever reason you still want to work in this business, <laughs> you can go check out one of those r- recruiters. Yes, sir. and uh, you know they'll get you on your way. They'll they'll get you in the business. They'll get you through the door. And if you keep listening to us, you'll uh, you'll know what you're talking about. And you know why they'll know what they're talking about, Ryan? Because next week. We're going to have an action-packed episode. It's going to have the shipping news. We're going to talk about freight terms. We're going to talk about the steamship lines. We're going to talk about the alliances. We're going to give everybody a little bit of background to what goes on on the boat side. Indeed. Woo, we're getting really into it now. That one, yeah. We're, we're starting to fill in the gaps. It's uh, your place, Zelda. Yes. Yeah, remember the original yes, Zelda? I remember Zelda. I got that on my NES Classic. <laughs> and Jesus Christ, that, that game is a lot harder uh, as an adult than when you're a kid. Or maybe you just don't realize, I don't you'll play for hours and not realize you're dying all the time and, and it's just enjoyable. Yes, it's less frustrating you're from... when you're younger. <laughs> yeah, when you only have an hour of free time to dedicate and you, you barely make it through a dungeon. Yes. That that stuff. But but you know in Zelda, why I say that is in Zelda you start out with an all-black map. And as you walk to each place in the board, it, it opens up. Illumination. It expands <laughs> your map. So hopefully we expand our listeners' freight map and they can... um. They can come on. And you mentioned something earlier before before I sign off here uh, that I guess I'm not sure if we're going to if we should do two types sometimes like a, a one on one type and maybe something a little bit more technical, obviously, because we, we have listeners of all different skill sets and, and abilities. And um, surprisingly, uh, many of our listeners aren't even in the industry yet. So maybe they'll hit up your recruiter. But I don't know. Maybe we can put some sort of disclaimer beforehand. I know that one that's that's incredibly technical is probably going to be a little bit more. It's going to attract a different audience, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. You want to get the uh, get a little uh, disclaimer and let people know what they're what they're in for, so they're not uh, yeah they're over not buried their head too or... deep and yeah not going too deep into the water too soon or under their head too. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Although I try to you know teach you a little bit about Chinese New Year too. Indeed. Hey, and that's good for all ages. It really is. So, Ryan, got the Super Bowl coming up. Hey, wait, do you have any Super Bowl plans? What are you going to do? Uh, Not actually sure. Kind of leaving it up. We're playing it by ear this year, actually. We've had uh, we've had Super Bowl plans the past couple of years, so I think this one we're probably going to probably gonna lay low and play it by ear and maybe just get some, uh, some wings and some beverages right here at the old Casa de Dooley. Yeah, you would think during the Patriots ones, you know, you'd want to go out to, to a bar or have a big celebration, but... To me, it becomes such a crap show. Yeah. There's so many people out and, and you know, <laughs> lightweights drinking, and it's just, it just becomes kind of a mess. Oh, absolutely. And when it's a Patriots one that's involved, I actually want to watch the game. Exactly. If it's two teams that I really don't care about, then I'll go out because I'm like, oh, well, if I miss if I miss 10 minutes of the game, I don't really care. But if it's the Patriots, I really want to see what happens. Yeah, and you can you can even pause if you had to run to the bathroom and get back to real time with the DVR. Exactly. Yeah, it's a good setup. I might be... I might be right there with you metaphysically in the home. I got the little kids. I got the, the two-month-old and yeah. two-year-old. So we might be... Family you know, we Super Bowl. Might, we might be doing that one, too. Nice. <laughs> get yourself some wings. Get yourself some baby food. And have yourself a Super Bowl, sir. Sounds good. So hopefully when we're talking to you next, we'll be, we'll be what, five-time yeah. world champion New England Patriots. We'll be, dis- we'll be discussing them. Actually, we'll probably talk more about it if they lose, because if they win, 
I understand people hate him. It's a little. I don't want to be one of those those m holes. Yes. <laughs> and put it right in your face because it it's a little. It can get a little much. We will give a we will give a brief shout out to them. We will let them know if they've won or if they've lost. So either way, they will get their brief shout out, and that'll be that. For Tim Dooner. No, I'm Tim Dooner. <laughs> I was gonna say yes for Tim Dooner. Speaking on behalf of Tim Dooner. <laughs> for Ryan Dooley, this is Tim Dooner signing off on the shipping pod. You want to give me a hit from the rooster? <laughs> yeah, here comes the rooster. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough to do links here. It is really hard. It's hard to like to do that song. Yeah, it's so unique. It's like trying to sing it. If the Chinaman do come back, I think I'll